Have you heard about Nicolas Cage's wild collections? We'll tell you all about it on a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True. Hey, hey welcome back to The Internet Says It's True, where every week we learn something that sounds made up, but it's really true. This is part of the WCBE podcast experience, available on all podcast platforms, as well as the NPR app and website. Hey, I'm Michael Kent. This is episode 211, 211. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in every week. I've been home all week, which is incredible. It's that time of the year where the college tour starts to slow down just a bit, which is a little bit of a welcome change for me. Uh, Don't get me wrong, I love performing and touring around, but my gosh, it's good to be home. Uh, Make sure that you're you're keeping up and joining the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. When you do that, I'm going to send you some stickers in the mail, maybe some other goodies. Uh, It's also the only way to see the videos every week that we take. Basically, what happens is, you know, I invite my guests on Zoom, and uh, you get to see the unedited version before I go through and take out the naughty words and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. Sometimes you get to hear us sort of talking and and uh, catching up before we start recording for the for the podcast. So do that at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Hey, another good way to support the podcast is to pick up a t-shirt or a mug, uh, and that helps us in a couple ways. First of all, it helps, you know, rep the podcast to the people that you're around every day. They'll ask you, hey, what's this? What's on your shirt? Uh, and you can tell them about it. It gets more listeners. Uh, and it also just, you know, obviously helps us a little bit with the support. So this week's episode is a rare episode from recent history. For a lot of these episodes, we're talking about World War II or something that happened even hundreds of years ago. But this story happened within the last couple decades, and it may be one you've heard about. I'm fascinated with celebrities who have bizarre collections. Maybe it came from growing up in the 80s and hearing all the stories about Michael Jackson. It's almost a pathological study to look at MJ and his collections. One of the more famous things that he attempted to collect were the bones of Joseph Merrick, known to the world as the Elephant Man. While Jackson never actually acquired the skeleton, it helped to cement the reputation of what the media sometimes called Wacko Jacko, who collected strange things like self-portraits that painted the singer as all kinds of historic or religious figures. Lots of celebrities have made news through their eccentric collections. Rosie O'Donnell collected more than 2,500 toys from McDonald's Happy Meals. Tom Hanks famously collects vintage typewriters. Apparently, Demi Moore collects antique dolls, and Quentin Tarantino collects old board games. Collecting things is a fairly normal thing for people to do, but when it comes to strange or eccentric collections by celebrities, it's sometimes almost like they're trying to fill a void. When you're incredibly wealthy, like Jerry Seinfeld or Jay Leno, Collecting cars becomes an obsession and something they can control. It's not about the money as much as it is about the acquisition of something rare to help complete this collection. And some experts suggest that for people in the public eye, collecting provides a sense of grounding amidst a hectic lifestyle, offering sort of a structured way to feel attached to particular memories or interests. And this would certainly make sense in the case of Michael Jackson's zoo animals, or Rosie O'Donnell's McDonald's toys. It's almost like a nostalgia thing. And today's story is about the collections of the famous actor Nicolas Cage. His real name is Nicolas Coppola, but in an effort to stand out on his own and not use the legacy of the Coppola name, he chose the name Cage, inspired by the Marvel superhero Luke Cage. His fame on screen comes from films like Face Off, Leaving Las Vegas, and National Treasure, But it's his exaggerated acting style and eccentricity that has made him such a polarizing figure, not to mention taking roles in films that some people think are beneath him. In his personal life, Cage is well known for collecting. His most normal collection is probably his incredible comic books. As I mentioned a moment ago, his chosen last name is an allusion to comics, and his fascination with them is over the top. He even named his son Kal-El, the real name of Superman. He owned a copy of Action Comics No. 1, worth something like $6 million now. He bought it for like a million dollars. It got stolen. He reacquired it and then sold it for $2 million. And now the the cost has just skyrocketed. He also owns Detective Comics No. 27, worth around $2 million. Some of the bizarre purchases Cage has made aren't even part of a collection, but just eccentric things to own, like his own Gulfstream jet, two separate islands in the Bahamas, nine Rolls Royces, two yachts, 15 homes, 
and get this, several castles in Europe, including the Schloss Neidstein Castle in Germany and the Milford Castle in England. In New Orleans, Nicolas Cage purchased a pyramid-shaped tomb in a graveyard, and the expectation there is that he'll be buried in it one day. In his home, he's collected two albino king cobras, which are incredibly rare, and complement his menagerie of purebred dogs, rare birds, and lizards, and for some reason, a small collection of questionably authentic shrunken heads. And that brings us to a super rare collector's item, a dinosaur skull. We'll tell you all about it after a quick break. I'm John DeSando, host of Back Talk. This podcast is an extension of the long-running, award-winning movie review show, It's Movie Time. Back Talk features additional content and banter with guests about new movies. If you want more insight and information about what's playing now in theaters and online, find Back Talk at the WCBE Podcast Experience on WCBE.org. You'll be happy you did. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing balms, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. If you love listening to this podcast every week and you want to show your support, that would mean a great deal to me. You can do that by becoming a Patreon member. We've got members at all levels, whether you want to pledge $1 a month or $10 a month. Just think about the value that you receive from this show. And if you like the histories and the stories that you learn about or the jokes that you hear, and if you think that they're worth it, consider signing up. For that, you get every episode ad-free and a week early, access to bonuses like the unedited videos of the guest appearances, and 20% off all merchandise. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. We're living through the most dynamic time in human history, and what we do as leaders matter. We are the ones that create the leverage to shift directions of our companies, our nonprofits, and our communities. As a leader or an emerging leader, please join me for a dynamic conversation with top thought leaders, academics, and executives to learn more about how to elevate your leadership. I'm Maureen Metcalf. Join us at the WCBE podcast experience at wcbe.o. In 2007, a natural history auction was held in Manhattan by the I.M. Chait Gallery. The collection included a bunch of bizarre items like a meteorite from Mars, a large gold nugget, skulls from lions, hyenas, and warthogs, an Egyptian mummy's hand, and the prized item of the auction, the skull of a Tyrannosaurus batar. The Tyrannosaurus batar was a close relative of the Tyrannosaurus rex. It's also referred to as a Tarbosaurus batar. It lived in the late Cretaceous period, around 70 million years ago, and was officially discovered and named in 1955 from the remains that were dug a decade earlier. The name Batar is a misspelling of the Mongolian word meaning hero. It's slightly smaller than the T-Rex with shorter arms and more teeth. Scientists are unsure if the Tarbosaurus Batar is its own genus or just a subspecies of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. So this auction house, I am Chait, showed off this dinosaur skull, which they said was 67 million years old, 32 inches long, and around 65% complete. The lower right jaw and back of the skull were filled in with casts. David Herskowitz, the gallery's natural history director, said the skull was acquired in 2006 from a Japanese collector who had been storing it in a box for 50 years. It was the largest artifact of its kind to ever be sold at this type of auction to the public. I found some articles detailing the auction and the results, in which the name of the person who bought the skull wasn't divulged, but at the time, Herskowitz mentioned to the press that the buyer frequently shows off his collections to the public and was a known figure. It wasn't long until the word got out. The winner of the auction dinosaur skull was none other than Nicolas Cage. With a bid of $276,000, he had outbid Leonardo DiCaprio. 
He also purchased a giant wolf skull at that same auction for $50,000. Cage was excited to own the prized dinosaur skull and display it with the rest of his collection. And that was the end of the story until 2012. This is where we meet Preet Bharara. Bharara has been a famous player in American politics since 2006 when he was named Chief Counsel to Senator Chuck Schumer. He's held many roles, the most prestigious being the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. He's prosecuted high-profile cases like taking down insider trading, New York mafia bosses, leading counter-terrorism probes against Al-Qaeda, and more. He made news in 2017 when he famously refused to resign when Donald Trump was elected and forced the former president to fire him. In 2012, Barrara was working as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York along with Special Agent James T. Hayes Jr. of the New York Office of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. These two were working in response to multiple requests from the government of Mongolia. Eighteen dinosaur skeletons had been stolen from Mongolia, including two skeletons of the Tyrannosaurus batar. The bones had been smuggled into the U.S. using false customs and importation documents. They had even found the people responsible, a man named Eric Procopi, who called himself a, quote, commercial paleontologist, had pled guilty to conspiracy to smuggle illegal goods, possessing stolen property, making false statements, smuggling goods into the United States, and interstate sale of stolen goods. We don't know if Procopi was the man who smuggled the skull for sale by the I.M. Shake Gallery, but we do know that the gallery claims the seller was from Florida, which was also the location of Eric Procopi. All of these dinosaur bones had been looted from Mongolia after being discovered in the Gobi Desert, and now they were being returned to their rightful owners, the government of Mongolia. That's why, soon after Barrara's task force announced the return of these artifacts, Nicolas Cage got a visit from Homeland Security agents. When he learned of the true history of the skull, he agreed to turn it over and the skull was returned to Mongolia with the rest of the stolen property. Nicolas Cage's insane spending habits have landed him in financial hot water. He's had to foreclose on some of his properties and is often criticized for his poor investments. In 2019, the New York Times interviewed him and asked him about it. Cage claimed that it wasn't the eccentric collections like shrunken heads that got him in trouble, it was bad real estate purchases but he did mention the dinosaur skull fiasco. He also talked a little bit about why he was collecting these odd items. And this quote that I'm about to read is a little long, but I'm going to read the whole thing because it really shows off Cage's eccentricity. Here's what he told the New York Times' David Marchese. Quote, The dinosaur skull was an unfortunate thing because I did spend $276,000 on that. I bought it at a legitimate auction and found out it was abducted from Mongolia illegally, and then I had to give it back. Of course, it should be awarded to its country of origin, but who knew? Plus, I never got my money back, so that stank. But I went years where all I was doing was meditating three times a day and reading books on philosophy, not drinking whatsoever. That was the time when I almost went on, you might call it, a grail quest. I started following mythology, and I was finding properties that aligned with that. It was almost like national treasure. Of course, that didn't sustain, on top of which I said, I'm going to get off philosophy because I became like a kite with a string but no anchor. No one could understand what I was talking about. And I thought people would rather see me as an orangutan than as an eagle meditating on the mountaintop anyway. That's the end of the quote. So there you have it. An eagle, not an orangutan. Whatever that means. The internet says it's true. Yap Yap with me and a friend, and today I'm calling Eric Diddleman. Eric Diddleman, in addition to being one of my close friends and fellow entertainer, is now a roster mate of mine. He was just signed by my agent, so that's exciting. You can go to the same place and book us both. So um, if you don't know, if you haven't listened to the podcast before, Eric's a mind reader. He's been seen all over television from America's Got Talent to Ellen to Live with Kelly and Ryan to Fool Us. I'm so happy to have you back on the show, man. What's going on? Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're on the same roster now. That's exciting. Another exciting thing we were just talking about is that your Patriots have just tied the game and going into overtime. So we'll see how that goes. It's yeah, a, we won't know when this comes out, how the results of the game are yet. But uh, it's, it's <laughs> Patriots a, aren't great this year. So. No, it's a two-win Patriot team versus a one-win Titan team. So we'll yeah, see what happens exactly. here. Um, thanks for... for stepping away from the game for a minute to, to do this and course, uh you've been good 
Yeah, I'm good. Just, uh, you know, been busy, a uh, little tired from, you know, doing a lot of shows, but it's uh, not, uh, you know, not something I really can complain about because work is always good. That's so. right. Yeah. More work, the better. <laughs> always. Always. Yeah, it's getting to that point. Um, I was just saying to my listeners in the, it's getting to that point in the season where uh, shows start to slow down a little bit and I can start to take a breath, um, which has been really nice. My November is nice and slow. Um, and so normally I would be freaking out about that, but I've been so busy this year that I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to a change of pace right now yeah i need it yeah i've been um uh, performing at speakeasy magic almost every night this week the uh, hit off broadway show in new york city and on uh, fridays and saturdays we do two uh oh. shows that night so last night uh you know you have the eight o'clock early show and then the 11 o'clock late show which gets out at around one yikes, so, <laughs> yikes. It's great, yep. though. It's fun. No, I've been there. As long as the audiences are not too sleepy and too drunk, it's great. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And the, But then, you know, it's New York, so then you have to get home, and then, like, it takes mm -hmm. forever, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I brought you on today. I'm super happy to have you back, and this might be the first time you've been on since we've done this new segment where I ask my guests to come up with a fact that I oh. might not have heard about. Can yes, you tell I me a true fact yet. that there's, like, little chance I've heard before? Yeah, I've got a fact for you. Um, I so I'm, I'm like subscribed to too many like nerdy like TikToks about etymology and punctuation and stuff oh, like that. I love it. Yes. Um. So, do, do you know what the uh, the term is for the um, symbol, the paragraph symbol that you see in like type editing? No, no. I I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about, but no, I didn't know it had a name. Yeah, it looks like a little P with two lines uh, right. filled in. It's called the Pilcrow. The and, Pilcrow? Uh, oh, my this is God. A, that is a, I've never heard of a Pilcrow. How do you spell that? This is a that? fun fact about it. And I might be regurgitating this information I just learned incorrectly. Sure. So uh, bear with me. But you can fact check it on the internet, hence your show. But uh, what's interesting about it is back in the day, you know, medieval times, uh, they were saving paper so they would start paragraphs uh on the same line as other paragraphs it would just be continuous text okay. so to indicate kind of grouping of sentences they'd put this little symbol now eventually um i think in the middle ages they would have like the scribes but then they would send um the the written word to the the rubicons Rubi whatever the uh <laughs> there was another group of people that would make like fancy text uh like red text almost editors okay. and make these like amazing like uh glyphs um so they took this symbol and they would leave room for them to make these elaborate like pilcrows in the start of each uh paragraph oh, but as cool. soon as the printing press was invented there was such a strong demand for um for printing so that sometimes just to get it out there they didn't have time to put in the little hill crows. So that's why we leave a space for an indent at the beginning of paragraphs. That's amazing. <laughs> I am. I love that. Uh, yeah. That that's like now it's a feature, not a bug. Because now mm -hmm. it's like, oh, give our eyes a, a rest. And we know the difference between this paragraph and that paragraph. You know what I'm really curious now is um, why when we started using a typewriter, we, we it became the standard to use two spaces. That of course went away now that we're using uh, computers. They they decide, decided now that the proper thing is one space. My brother and I go over this because he wants the two spaces back, but he doesn't like right. that he's been told it's only supposed to be one space now. Um, and I'm assuming it's because typewriters maybe didn't leave enough of a space between. I think from what I hear, well, first of all, I'm in the two space camp too because I right? still just have it forming from uh, learning keyboarding and when I was a kid in grade school, but uh, yeah. so it's hard to break that habit. But I, I thought it had something to do with the key jamming. Um, so it was the idea of like, you had to hit it twice or you had to like leave enough space so that there was not like the, whatever the little thing that comes up from the typewriter doesn't get jammed with another key. Oh, I'm going to look into that. That's a, that's a great I, question. I could be wrong. I could and totally if, be wrong. <laughs> for, for my listeners, if you do know the answer to that, please let me know. I'm curious. Uh, let's get into the quiz this week. For question one, we're going to play for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you got to tell me a joke. If you get it right, I'll tell you the awful joke that I found. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas right. Cage once bought mm -hmm. a dinosaur skull at an auction for over a quarter of a million dollars. 
Why was this a problem? Was it A, because it was fake, B, because it was stolen, or C, he didn't have a quarter of a million dollars? I believe, if I recall, I sort of know the story a little bit. If I recall, I think it was stolen. The answer, B, it was stolen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he didn't steal it. <laughs> he, right. He, he bought it from someone else who was, he, once it was yeah, already no, stolen. Yeah, no, he dug it out of the basement of a museum to return. No, yeah, he, he bought it at an auction for a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, the person who stole it, I, they probably didn't steal it either. But it had been stolen from Mongolia, along mm. with a ton of other stuff. So um, the our government had a very specific, it was Preet Bharara, who has done a ton of stuff in politics. Uh, he was the one that led this task force with the SDNY to recover all of these stolen goods uh, and give them back to Mongolia. Almost See? all artifact related, dinosaur related. What they should have done, Michael, is have the Mongolian equivalent of Nicolas Cage do a huge heist and steal it from Nicolas Cage in a reverse national treasure situation. Yeah, national treasure <laughs> for Mongolia. National yeah. <laughs> Mongolian treasure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what did the dinosaur make his bathroom floor out of? <sighs> What did he make it out of, Michael? Reptiles. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Stupid. Yeah, you know, I was looking for an adult dinosaur joke, and I just didn't have the time. So we found sure, the one. Sure, sure. I like Absolutely. it. I like it. Um, can I tell you my most exciting uh, discovery, speaking of discoveries uh, of mm -hmm. the day? And this goes along with me being 45 years old. Uh, I found, so I wear these, like, slippers around the house that are the wool in, you know, the, the insides are like the, the fuzzy wool, sheer sure. layer, whatever they call it. Yeah. I just found uh, sole inserts with like arch supports for the insides of those that have wool. Ooh. How exciting is that? That's, this is not a good. paid advertisement. It's just it like literally just came to my head as we were talking about this. I found it like a few hours ago and I'm excited. They're really expensive, but I'm so excited that I can put those into my. Just, into just my for comfort sake. Yeah. Um, well, when, since you're talking about fun footwear, um, sometimes I wear my Cotties. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, that's going to be the screenshot that we use for the uh, uh -huh. website right there. Um, a Cotty is, if you're not familiar, which I am not, this is my first time seeing this, it's literally, it looks like a slide type slipper, but it's a yeah. fish. Uh, it is a fish. a fish. He's yep. got fish on his feet right now. They're surprisingly comfortable. They don't look comfortable. So I look like I would trip all over the place wearing those things. There's lots of edges and things sticking out. My God. Okay, for the next question, we're going to play for a Mongolian dinosaur skull uh, discovered right. in the Gobi Desert. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to play for this. This is a uh, pencil that I've been trying to give away for three weeks. It says, because F adulting on it. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to give this away since I did the Wire Pencils Yellow episode a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and no one has gotten this question right, so it's still here. But it will be yours if you get this question right. Wait, what fun things will it say once you sharpen it and the text goes away? The text starts here, halfway <laughs> okay. down. So you get to, so it will eventually say, cause F adulting. And then it will say, use F adulting. It says the mm -hmm. word, not the word, not the F. It says gotcha. the word. And then it'll just say F adulting. And then eventually it'll just say adulting. Because if you're using a pencil that's an inch long, I guess that you're you're being the, <laughs> scrupulous. The struggle with your is money. real. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're being financially responsible, and you are adulting. Okay, For, <laughs> here's your question: The Gobi Desert crosses which two countries? Is it A. Mongolia and Bhutan, B. Mongolia and China, or C. Mongolia and Kazakhstan? This is kind of a tough one. Um, let's see. I do like geography. Uh, I'm going to say definitely Mongolia is one of the answers. <laughs> <laughs> You're halfway there. Um, I want to say, I always thought it was at the border of Mongolia and China. I'm going to say Mongolia and China. The answer is B, Mongolia and China. Yeah. Yeah. Too. Are you going to be in uh, Lincolnshire here in a few weeks? 
No, I'll be in Lexington. Are you going to Lexington? I won't be in Lexington. Oh, all I right. I will see you at some point. I'll put this in my bag so I always have it. And yeah. I'll give it to you next time I see you. Great. And I can't no wait to else. sharpen it down to adulting. <laughs> adulting. No one else has the ability to win this pencil. You finally cracked the curse of me trying to give that pencil away. Well, you can um, give it to our new agents. And that's then, right. Uh, the, we, I give it to them. They'll give it to you. It'll be a whole thing. You'll get that in lieu of payment for one of these shows coming up. <laughs> Uh, so for question three, similar to the pencil, it's always the same. It is a sure. sticker and it's an, it says the internet says it's true. And I'll give you as many as you want because, um, I'm mad at sticker mule. This, uh, so in 1923, an American paleontologist was in the Gobi desert and he discovered an artifact that was the first ever discovered of its kind. Which mm. one of these was it? So this is 1923. They had never seen one of these before as a, as an art, as a fossil. A, the first ever dinosaur egg to be discovered. B, the first ever T-Rex skeleton. Or C, the first ever dinosaur poop. Interesting. Um, I feel like a skeleton was probably before that time frame. Eggs, I feel like, probably survived and were found. Knowing you and your uh, typical flair for certain types of uh, trivia, I'm going to say the dinosaur poop might be the answer. You think that I went scatological with this question? Yeah. The answer was an egg. Your your first information was the right one. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this one is his name was Roy Chapman Andrews. And if you look up Roy Chapman Andrews, the, the really interesting thing is they believe that he was the inspiration for Indiana Jones. Oh, interesting. Yeah. This guy was an American paleontologist that was in the Gobi Desert, and he first found a dinosaur egg. So you're two for three at this point. Um, I don't get any stickers. We're just no fine. stickers. The I'm, Indiana Jones, by the way, probably also inspired Nicolas Cage's character in absolutely. National, absolutely. National Treasure. And I know that because whenever I think of the, the quote, this belongs in a museum, I can never remember if it's Harrison Ford or Nicolas Cage who's saying it. It go. belongs in a museum, which is is so an Indiana Jones. Full but circle. It seems full like it's circle. something that could be in um, <laughs> National Treasure. The National. I every time the National Treasure movie is on TV, the first one, I'll always watch it. It's great. And the second one, yeah. there's a there's three, right? Are there three? I there's maybe think just there's two. maybe two. The second one's like Book of Secrets, maybe. Yeah, and I, that one's never on television, so I never see that one. But. I just love how like you can sum up that movie by him going like this means this, this means that to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and but it's also like the other thing that's so similar is that Indiana and his father are both sort of doing the same thing, and the same with National Treasure. Like him and his dad are both interested yeah. in the treasure hunting. So is that Do right? You confuse yeah. Yeah, yeah. John Voight with um, Sean Connery <laughs> with Sean Connery? Bit? No. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess I. I, I I guess I could see either one of them filling each other's roles. So possibly. Yeah. John Voight, I think is the better. He's so good at that. (laughs) Yeah. Sean Connery. We named the dog Indiana. Uh, I feel like we had, didn't we recently have, I think I had a trivia question on here about a dog named Indiana, maybe a few weeks ago. Listeners will tell me at this point, they know better than I do about what I've done on this show. So absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, okay. So question four, we're going to play for a joke that never okay. worked. Okay, so, sure. So this, yeah. So like, you know, maybe this was a, uh, something that you've written in your notebook or do you keep a, how do you keep your notes for when you're writing jokes and stuff? Do you do it on your phone? Um, all over the place, mostly in random separate notes in my notes app. Oh yeah. Same. And they're, yeah. and that's horrible. I, I can't, I don't know what they mean. I go through I them. I have no idea do, what they mean. I did label at least like the top of the note, like stand up, so I can search stand up. But it's like a whole bunch of notes that I have to weed through. Yeah. So let me see if I can find, yeah, one that I can potentially play for. And some of these are not even work jokes that necessarily worked, but like half ideas sure. that could have worked if I put more time into them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But if you've got one that maybe you, you thought it was funny, you ran it on stage, and then it mm. just didn't work. That's the kind of stuff I love. Okay. Yeah, I think I've tried this one. We'll try it. So okay, um, but I got, but only if I get it wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm looking through my notes right now, looking for um. I I feel like I did this last week too, but 
uh, looking for. Okay, here you go. This is a great one. Um, and I don't owe you anything yet because we haven't even done the question, but this is interesting. Sure. Uh, I have an iCloud note. This is an iCloud note from December 18th of 2017. And that was my wife's birthday. Here's what I was thinking about. Bugs, period. Killing bugs, period. Kill more bugs. <laughs> kill effing bugs. Spray shit to kill bugs. And then bump caps for bug killers. I don't know what that means. That was a stand-up joke? No, I mean, it's just a note. It's obviously <laughs> meant to something. But I can tell you also, oh, you know what? I figured out exactly. I just remember what this is. I know exactly what this is. This is hilarious. <laughs> I was in a training video for, I got cast for uh, Terminex. Okay. The oh, bug is this and your line readings? No, this was <laughs> me. In the scene, they wanted me to, this was an employee training video, and they had me sitting in the break room on my phone. Like the character was on the phone, was was typing stuff yeah. on the phone, and that's what I was typing. So this was me pretending that I was, you know, doing like whatever on my phone. I don't even know if it was a break room or if that was part of the shoot, but the bump cap part was the fun part of that shoot because a bump cap is a hat that they wear that's kind of like a hard hat, but it's built into a ball cap. and it's so that when they're in an attic, they don't hit their head off the, the rafter beams. Oh. And what they had me do for the shoot over and over was they built in a sound studio. They built a, an attic and had me bumping my head off of the rafters for like two hours. We shot this thing. Oh. I've never seen the footage. I would love to see the footage. I've That's emailed exciting. the director asking for the footage and I have not, I've never seen it. So that was, that was uh, 2017. And those Pretty were the notes. Great. Okay, let's get into our story. Uh, we're going to, so which one of these stories is a real thing, a real thing that actually happened to Nicolas Cage? A, okay. his assistant had a mental breakdown and tried to kill him. B, his uncle jumped to his death off the Hollywood sign. Or C, he once found a naked man at the foot of his bed eating a fudge sickle. Huh. One of these is I a real thing that happened to Nicolas Cage. I don't know my Nicolas Cage lore that well. <laughs> um, these all seem maybe plausible, but... Anything is uh, plausible when it's Nicolas Cage. The mental break sounds most likely, but for funsies, let's go see the naked C. man with the fudgesicle. Good instinct. It is C. He once found <laughs> a naked man at the foot of his bed eating a fudgesicle. The man had broken into his Orange County home. He was... Wearing one of Nicolas Cage's leather jackets. And uh, Nicolas Cage just talked to the guy until the police arrived. They just, <laughs> they just hung out until the wow. police arrived. Now, interesting, the A uh, option, his assistant had a mental breakdown and tried to kill him. That happened to David Spade. That is a okay. Spade story. And uh, when David Spade was on, I believe it was uh, Mark Maron's show, uh, mm. he told that story. And it's a crazy story worth looking at, looking for. And then B... That I just made that up, the Hollywood sign thing. But yeah, he found a naked dude at the end of his bed eating a fudge sickle. Who knew? <laughs> who knew? Did he um, offer him another fudge sickle while the police I, came? Who knows? I'm just I just love the the fact that this guy came in and uh, a that he just went through the freezer and b that Nicolas Cage had fudge sickles, fudge sickles because uh, for a while there they were really hard to find. We yeah. have them in our fridge right here, <laughs> our freezer right now, and for a long time you couldn't find fudge sickles. Right. So. All right, moving on. Uh, you are currently three for four. Question five is for all the marbles. If you get it right, you're welcome back on the Wait, podcast. You, have to, you owe me a joke from oh, your notebook. I, uh, yeah, the, I think I don't really have one, but I think the, um, yeah, I, I could go through and find more, but I think the one from that I wrote about the bugs is probably. That's, that's um, going to qualify as a joke. Yeah, I do have, I do have a, a note right next to that. So this was from January, uh, the next January then. And it, it's four lines, but they're four, spe four separate jokes. And I don't know why I wrote these, but I know the jokes that go with all of these. Small, medium, at large, cons, all meet, super calloused, fragile, and disaster. These are all pun-based jokes. Um, yes. The last one is, did you hear about the woman that backed up into an airplane propeller? Disaster. I yeah, That's... that actually happened recently. There was a news article. Oh no! Like there was 
Yeah, someone was like taking a photo of a plane and backed up into the propeller. Into the so where were you with this tragedy that happened, Michael? Ready for your one line zinger pun? <laughs> Did I just get canceled? Uh, <laughs> now, cons all meet is the punchline to a joke about Genghis Khan used to send in a bunch of tough guys that uh, that they didn't eat any meat, um, and they would be the first ones to conquer a city before the rest of the force came in, and they only ate grain, um, and they were known as Khan's all wheat meanies. Um, so that's yep. that one. Yep. Super callous, yep. fragile is about Gandhi wearing sandals and with bad breath. And the punchline to that one was super calloused, fragile, mystic, hexed by halitosis. Mm -hmm. um, small, yep. medium, small, medium yep. at large is the little person uh, fortune teller who was yeah. missing or something. Yeah. I, so. I also just want to make it clear. We're not laughing at the tragedy. Just the fact that the picture of you may be doing a pun being there. Yeah. Yeah. It's humorous to me. Like imagine I was sitting in the airplane as it happened and I sat yeah. to the person just next to me. Look at that mm -hmm. disaster. Yeah, um, terrible. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Mm -hmm. It's one of those jokes I think also it's difficult to say. You kind of have to that's a written joke because it's difficult yeah, like yeah. disaster versus disaster. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> this has been Okay, question 5 is for all the marbles. If you get it right, you're welcome back on the podcast anytime. If you're wrong, you get banned Great. for life. And this is a two-part question. Okay. First part number 1, do you currently collect anything? Do you have any collections? I had a bunch of collections when I was little. I don't know what happened to them, uh, but I used to collect Pez. I also used to collect Wait, banks. the candy or the dispensers? The the dispensers, yeah. Okay, because I collect the candy, but not the dispensers. I love, oh, I don't just... collect it, I eat it. I love, Pe I will buy two pounds of Pez in the bag from Amazon and just in eat uh, Pez. In Connecticut, you could go to the Pez Museum and <gasps> see the whole slew of dispensers over the years. Where, is that in Hartford? Amazing. Uh, it's, uh, it's like near, it's like, I think it's off of 95 somewhere. Ooh. Well, that's what I'm doing next time I'm in Connecticut. I didn't know yeah. about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I also collected banks when I was a kid. Oh, that's fun. Like little coin banks. Yeah. Oh, we should catch up with your mom and ask her if the banks are still there. Yeah. I don't we know we once called your mom live on the podcast. We don't need to do that again. We'll let her watch true. the Patriots over time. But, um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So question, but you don't have either of those anymore. Those are just somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere. The The second part of this is if money was no object, what would you collect? If anything? Oh, that's easy. If money is no object, do you know how expensive Lego is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so expensive. That is so, a good question. I think, I think also part of this question must be like having enough space. If space, space. was no object either. Space. Yeah, Since but if I live no in New York object, City can... in an apartment and don't right. really have a place to have no, a lot of Lego money's sets. Money's no object, or... Eric. You buy another apartment just specifically to show off your Lego. Okay, the, great. Yeah. The Diddleman Lego Museum. Yeah. Uh, are we talking current Lego or like vintage? Would you seek out vintage Lego? Um, I don't know. I think I think just whatever the coolest nerdy set is. It's I find it very therapeutic with my mind's racing and everything, just following instructions, putting the Lego together. I was obsessed with that Lego Master Show, just watching all the like the pros do it too yeah. on TV. But uh, yeah, yeah, they got I some now, some fun fun ones coming out. I put a I put a Lego cabinet together upstairs. Like there's a cabinet that has Lego and. A lot of my Lego are lit with like light tailing or, or um, there's a few different companies that sell lighting kits for Lego. And I, I got the, like, I, I decided I was going to hook them all up to a USB with like a smart switch. So I could just be like, you know, Alexa, Lego on. And like all my Legos would light up, but then the cabinet doesn't have any way to get the cords into it. So I'm going to have to drill a hole. <laughs> and it's a whole project, but yeah. Can you imagine like walking into a museum and be like, lego on and then like all your legos just light up and glow <laughs> well speaking of museums and especially themed for the show with uh you know nicholas cage i guess the smarter answer would be like art like collect art because yeah. you know appreciate better but i feel like lego's almost at that stage because it's just so expensive too. It, it is it <laughs> is but also like art if you were appreciative of the art like if you were an art a person who liked art, that would be great. But if money's no object, I always think of art collection as more of like an investment. 
you know, sure. it's like kind of like collecting coins. It's kind of like, you know, mm-hmm. you're not really looking at them very often. It's more about like you own the value of this thing that you're going to wait and sit on and it gains value, which could be true yeah. of Lego, but Lego are also toys, which mm-hmm. is fun. Yeah. So what if we went like Carmen San Diego route and like I said, like monuments? My, collect, <laughs> my, I collect countries. <laughs> it's like the Eiffel Tower is mine. <laughs> St. Yeah. Louis Arch, mine. <laughs> or or like passport stamps. Well, that's that easier to do. It is, but not She really. would steal actual, like, like she would steal the great pyramids of Giza. Uh, okay. Oh, I don't, rem- I don't think I remember that. I, my yeah. experience with Carmen Sandiego is the television show and not the video game. So, so, I, so the Rockapella song stuck in your head. Mm bop, doop, do a mm bop, bow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put some bass into that one. Bow. Yeah, <laughs> my lord. Um, <laughs> that's that's it, man. You're welcome back on the podcast. You got Hooray! that one right. I I thought and thought. Oh, I was gonna say this came up. Um, you were talking about passport stamps is easy. There are some places where passport stamps are very very difficult. Really, uh, I have one in my old passport book that is very difficult to get. Um, and I've been to this place four times and I only got a passport stamp once no three times I only got a passport stamp once uh, it's from Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean so the passport stamp is British Indian Ocean territories it's a beautiful oh. stamp with sea turtles on it um, and you can't you can't get to this island unless you've been invited by the Navy and so I've I, I spent Christmas there one year but it is a very rare passport stamp and I imagine there are some that you like yeah. for instance if you, I know that there are some Middle Eastern countries that you cannot get into if you also have Israel as a passport stamp in your book. Sure. So yeah. if you like, you know, took your birthright trip or whatever like that, and then, you know, a few years later tried to go to Syria, I don't know what countries, what other countries they are, but there are some that do not let you, you know, and I know that I've been told, I've been to Bahrain a few times and they, I've been told that other Middle Eastern countries, they will not let you in if your passport is like, has bent edges they consider it like tampered with or something. Some weird wow. stuff. Some people are very strict well, about that type of thing. I stand corrected. Not not easy to get. But yeah. I mean, you can travel and get easy countries and to you, add to your collection. But if you have like a rare one, what are you going to do with it? You can't like sell it to someone else or anything. You're just showing it off. You're showing badge it off. Of, badge of honor, right? Yeah. And I've yeah. looked into this because like it was sad for me when I when my old passport expired because I had some really great stamps in it. So I found, I haven't done this yet, but there's an Etsy um, person who like takes your old passport mm. pages and turns them into wall art they mount them on blo- on little like four by four blocks that you can like put up and make a whole thing out of so hodge i'm sure project. there's ones too like with countries that don't exist anymore too like those gotta Ooh, be rare right yeah absolutely that's a good yeah. point like a czechoslovakian stamp would be a, a yeah. great one to have yeah absolutely that's a good point point. and you and i collect places we visited on roadside america Yes. Oh, I do do that digitally. Yeah, so, yeah, so when I'm traveling, I call it very obvious geocaching because they're <laughs> usually like very large objects. Yeah. Um, like 40 so. foot statue of a man holding a hot dog by the side of the road. Yeah. Um, and then you just, just click bin there on the app and it's random all kitschy stuff, roadside like stops. The world's largest catfish or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, just I went to it and I thought uh, it was worried that it was going to be a different monument and then I got catfished. Hey, oh, that's funny. <laughs> That is that would be really funny. They should do that on purpose. World's largest catfish, and it's just like <laughs> nothing there. Oh, that's really good. Uh, well, <laughs> everyone, go check out Eric Dittleman. He is E R I C D I T T E L M A N dot com, or you can just check out him. Check him out on all the socials. He's on all the socials, and you can see where he is performing. If you are in New York City, catch him at Speakeasy. Um, lots of other places you can go speakeasy and see. Speakeasy Magic, yes. Speakeasy Magic, yeah. excuse me. Not There's m- lots of speakeasies in New York City. Yeah, Speakeasy, speakeasy Magic, magic is with, a, with a CK at the end. So Ooh. That kind, yeah, so the, search speakeasymagic.com to buy tickets to see me at that show. Uh, when I'm not there, I'm on the road traveling around performing at all sorts of places. Absolutely. Well, it's great to have you back on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey. That's all for this week. Thank you so much to Eric Dittleman for being my guest, and thanks to you for listening. Here's the voice of little Nathan Arizona Jr. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. To listen to episodes ad-free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that 
at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton, because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it! See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Joshua Endress, Dallas Ray, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Jim and Joanne Martin, Mitch and Andrew Joseph Kemplin, and the show's official emperor, Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and all audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Kent.